Here's the deal. The conservative movement in this country, unfortunately from my point of view, is now the leader on this issue of reform in that you look at Mississippi, a rock rib, totally conservative, former jailer is the governor there, Governor Bryant. Governor Bryant has cut the prison population and crime at the same time. Deal in Georgia cut the prison population and crime at the same time. Rick Perry cut the prison population, prison expenditures, and crime at the same time. Ohio, South Carolina, what you're seeing now are Republican governors being tough on the dollars, tough on crime, and shrinking prison populations and showing the rest of the country that it can be done. Now, my problem is I now have a conservative movement that for libertarian reasons, for Christian conservative reasons, and for fiscally conservative reasons, is actually doing a great job on what should be my issue. This is supposed to be my issue. You are stealing my issue. So. Welcome back, welcome back. This is your co-host, Marcus Flowers, a.k.a. Flo, a.k.a. Call Me What You Want, Just Don't Call Me Lazy, and I am joined by... It's your boy, Metro Meta, lover of Mimikyu, the one who stands above all others, the one who will rise above. And this is Volume 3, Episode 16. 16 episodes, Morgan. We're, uh, we're getting up there. I know. Crazy. Uh, but anyway, Volume 3, Episode 16 of the Super Flow Bro Podcast. Uh, before I begin, uh, Morgan, how have uh, things been with you? Uh, pretty good. You know, February was a pretty exhaustive month for me uh, just because of my uh, just what I was doing in education. But uh, hopefully March will be a bit easier. Dope, dope, man. Uh, yeah, so let's just, uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, so, uh, I don't know if you remember that, uh, original X-Men, uh, movie franchise, but Ian McKellen apologizes for being tone deaf. So, the former, uh, let me scroll up real quick. So, the former, the former X-Men star apologizes for Brian Singer and Kevin Spacey comments. Uh, at this point, I think people need to just stop making comments on those people. At this point, I feel like you should just stop talking, period. Me? So, no, 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 no. Uh, people, you know, people like, people like Ian McKellen. So, so uh, well, if you stop talking, how would I do a podcast? But I don't know. <laughs> all right, so, and as an openly gay actor... Ian McKellen has used his platform to speak on multiple social issues throughout his career. However, the former X-Men star came out of fire after making comments that appeared to excuse the actions of problematic public figures, Kevin Spacey and Brian Singer. So we have covered uh, Kevin Spacey, uh, not Brian Singer as much, just because we don't find him relevant over here. But um, Brian Singer has been known to uh, basically sexually assault his... Uh, the people who are working under him they're on his movie sets. So, Ian McKellum, he said, as part, of the, as part of an extended podcast recently, I suggested that if I, if closeted people were instead open about their sexuality, they wouldn't abuse others. That, of course, is wrong. My intention was to encourage the LGBT audience I was addressing to be proud and open about their sexuality. In doing so, my point was clumsily expressed. I would never ever trivialize or condone abuse of any kind i'd rather think so this was uh this these were his uh this was his original comment 
I'd rather think that's up to the public. Do you want to see someone that's been accused of something that you don't approve of? Do you ever want to see them again? If the answer is no, you won't buy a ticket. You won't turn on the television, but there may be others for whom that's not a consideration, and it's difficult to be exactly uh, black and white. So, basically, McCollum was like, hey, uh, if we condemn these people, we uh, will not be able to... Uh, be able to witness their amazing talent anymore, which um, I, which I don't even want to give him credit for that because that's just idiotic. Because I feel like I could have done without the uh, three horrible X Men movies. Well, I could have done without the X Men universe in general. Uh, and no, I, hey, 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 hey! Slow your roll. That X Men universe gave us the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, Let's not forget did it. That, that, that was already a It started it out. It started out the superhero wave. Okay, Morgan, that did not start the superhero wave. You weren't even around for the Batman movies. But yeah, that's off subject. That's off <laughs> subject. Anyway, yeah, and I could deal without Kevin Spacey as an actor or a director or whatever he does. Um, yeah, it just goes to... <laughs> um, and his comments just proved that he was speaking from a, from a place of privilege that many... Uh, people in that community he was talking to do not get to experience or do not have access to. To this effect, I think this is, for me, as I listen to his quote, I feel like it's more him equating two things that aren't connected. I feel like he's trying to connect the ideal that the fact that Kevin Spacey and people like him were closeted gay and that they were trying to hide their sexuality caused them to be violent, which isn't true and isn't a even if it's a correlation it's not a causation and he was trying to use that correlation as a way to uh, uh, as a way to just get more people who are in the closet to be more openly uh, to be more openly gay um, at the end of the day of course we do want if you are someone who is part of the LBGTQ you should be upfront with it you should uh, live your truth but this excuse that if you this it's honestly fear mongering saying like if you are gay and you don't tell people you're gay you're gonna end up raping people it's just not it's not a connection yeah for sure um yeah i just think he misspoke and well i don't want to say misspoke i think he knew what he said i just feel like he said it in the wrong way I just uh, continues to prove that we are in a different era than what he's used to, and he needs to uh, get adjusted with the times and uh, know that certain things that you have said back in the day or in previous years will not uh, fly in 2019. Yeah. Okay. So next, uh, we talked a little. We talked about this uh, last week, but the Steven Spielberg uh, beef against. Uh, Streaming only, streaming only uh, movies, uh, cinema continues. So Spielberg is so Spielberg is the governor of the Academy. So um, I could be mistaken here, but with the Academy who votes for the Oscars, there's like two levels. There's like the members and the governors, and the governors are um, the governors are like the people who make the decisions, basically, and everybody else gets to vote. So basically, um. So basically, uh, Spielberg he is proposing he is proposing a rule change at next month's Academy Board of Governors meeting to restrict eligibility for films that do not have a significant theatrical run. A reaction to a strong showing by the Netflix release of Alfonso Cuarón's *Roma* at this year's Oscars, and the Academy said that award rules discussions are ongoing with the branches, and the board will likely consider the topic at the April meeting. Morgan, before I give my opinion, how do you feel about just uh, Spielberg's uh, attack, basically attack on streaming services? It's dumb. It's dumb for multiple reasons. Number one, the first thing is that he's going after these uh, films because he, as an old type of person, uh, he believes in quality of film. And what he's saying is basically... When you stream a movie, it doesn't have the same impact as when you're in a theater. It's not the same quality, which to a certain extent is true. It does take a bit of a hit when you stream a movie compared to when you like watch it live in a theater. But at the same time, like we're moving on. Like theaters aren't as bumping as it is, and the Oscar, 
the Oscars are honestly, it's hard enough for the Oscars to be relevant right now to already cut out the most relevant movies that are g- coming out. That's ridiculous. That's the dumbest ideal ever. That's doubling down on stupidity. And on top of all that, when you look at platforms like Hulu, like Amazon, like Netflix, they're honestly the only platforms that are pushing and supporting uh, movies of people who are lesser known and movies of people of color, if we're being truthful. Yeah, like, no, that is uh, – sorry to interrupt. But, yeah, that is yeah. where uh, that is where uh, he's really trying to attack it. He, uh, I just feel like Spielberg, he sees his, like, elitism in the film industry being threatened by services who are willing to take risks when it comes to uh, filmmakers of color. And uh, such as, so basically the the Hollywood machine, when he was making like E.T. or even the uh, E.T. or the Raiders of the Lost Ark or other films of that nature, uh, Hollywood today would not have gone with that because Hollywood doesn't take risks, but uh, uh, indie, uh, not I don't know one. I don't even want to say indie, but a streaming service like Hulu, like Netflix, like Amazon Prime, they're willing to take those risks because they don't have anything to lose. And him, him also just completely saying that uh, theater that all movies have to have like theater releases, like that want to be nominated for Oscars have to have theater releases. Just doesn't make doesn't make sense in the long run, just because. When we're looking at it, a lot of uh, a lot of people aren't going to see the movies that get Oscar nominations or even get or even win Oscars because it's like weird. There's certain movies that uh, vid that uh, film companies know will bomb worldwide, so they release them in certain cities like Chicago, New York, and L.A. for limited releases, and then they do like a worldwide release, but it's only like one thousand theaters, and so. And the other thing to uh to like Netflix and Amazon and Hulu's credit is that they are at these uh film festivals and they are purchasing the rights to the to the same films that that Warner Brothers, that Fox, that Paramount that they all have passed on. So it's basically it's still the same quality of filming. It's just a different uh, viewing point of it. And when we're talking about movie theaters and just the quality just like why sometimes it's just like why would i go to a movie theater when i when i have a theater like experience at my crib if i have like the surround sound if i have like the large screen i don't have to move out of the comfort of my crib to watch a quality movie that's already on netflix and hulu if and i've already paid 9.99 a month for it instead if i go to the movies i have to pay an additional 9.99 just to see a movie that I could have waited six weeks to see um, when it gets to uh, those streaming platforms. Yeah. And this is, it's a big problem that Hollywood has because Hollywood is having this change between you have old Hollywood, which uh, is upholding just quality and the absolute, and we're talking, when you talk to people like Steven Spielberg and say stuff like, it's not as good quality, they're talking about like image quality. And it's sort of the same thing with gamers when they talk about like 60 FPS compared to 30 FPS. Like honestly, most people don't even notice the exact dip in quality, but those people, they spend so much time looking at movies and seeing film that they're just, they're looking at that to an extent that's just like, at that point, nobody else cares. Like it doesn't matter to anybody else. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, but uh, moving on, so uh, a little bit of fashion, well, a little bit of sneaker news. Uh, Jerry Lorenzo keeps putting his foot on sneakerhead's neck. So uh, Jerry Lorenzo, he is the creator of the Fear of God clothing line, and of course, the Fear of God one uh, sneakers. They have already released two uh, colorways of the sneakers. You have the white and the black. This time, he's coming back with the green based colorway to release this spring so and it's like a lime green so uh the summer will bring is vibrant seasonal takes on jerry lorenzo's debut signature model with the nike air fair of god one in addition to the sherbert like orange post makeup the wrap-up lace high top will be delivered in a minty execution dubbed frosted spruce 
As the hue's name indicates, the soft shade of green is prominently featured on the shoe's upper TPU cage and midsole, only slightly offset by a blue tint to zoom cushioning window. Now, although Nike hasn't officially announced a release date for this colorway, expect this to drop sometime in the spring for $350 or $350. So I'm thinking this will probably drop in uh, either mid-April or maybe even, I want to say early to mid-April. Morgan, did you get a chance to look at the shoe and tell me your thoughts about it? I did, and I hate it. I hate it. I hate the color. Why? I hate the color green. I feel like we need to stop using it in clothing, especially shoes. I hate the color green. Now, if it was in, like, the black or whites, I'd be down for that. But green? No. Awful. Worst color. Ugly. Well, all right. There is that. <laughs> all right. Okay. Uh, Next. Uh, So... Have you been seeing uh, Kanye's Sunday Services clips, Morgan? Uh, I saw the one, uh, the one with everybody in white. Can we take a minute and think about how crazy it is that Kanye West could just invite like a bunch of people out to the middle of the desert or whatever, and all white to play some music? Like, okay. that's some uh, weird stuff. <laughs> first of all, <laughs> first of all, uh, dang, I don't have no alarm. But first of all. I would never go out with a black man who's married to a white woman to the middle of the desert. desert. Sorry, that's just not me. <laughs> but uh, Kanye's Sunday services is basically like a cult. I don't want to say a cult, but it is a cult. It's not a cult. Where he, uh, where he plays like gospel songs, his own music, uh, classic music. Um, and like I've seen the clips and it's just like... I've been noticing, especially with, like, black Americans, I've been uh, very, especially, like, young uh, black Americans, I've been very uh, surprised because um, because it's just, like, he's playing, like, three simple uh, keys, playing, like, the C, C, E, C, E, G keys, and it's just, like, that's all he's doing, and that should not, if you, like, I don't want to say, I don't want to talk about anybody, but if you have been raised in a black church just growing up in a black church him playing three keys and wearing all white should not should not move you because you you seem better and it just goes to show that like just as like black americans uh they've gone just like as a culture we've gone away from being raised in the church i mean for me uh, from the quotes i've seen from what i've seen from it it really just seems like something that he's doing for fun. Like he's just like, "Hey, let's go out, let's play some music." And I've listened to, uh, I've seen some people talk about this and um, what he's doing. And at the at the end of the day, I think it, it's not even the matter of uh, it's not even the matter of whether or not he's playing a lot because he's playing he's playing three keys, but you can see the arrangement in his head and you can definitely see that it's less of a it's less of him producing a song but more of him like thinking about what a potential song could sound like the beginning of like what a song would be and i think it has more to do with the fact that as a community we we don't remember what it used to be like to like to make music like nowadays we get music right now when it's when it's done it's finished whereas in the past we used to see the entire production. We used to like think about the entire production, and we don't see it from beginning to end. And I think that's what people are really responding to is just a the connection of gospel music, and b them being able to see what it's like when you start at the beginning, where everybody's standing around, and we're like, all right, we're about to record a song. Well, all Kanye has to do is have a choir and all white singing to get y'all back. Easy peasy lemon squeezer. Uh, that's how I feel about that. That's all I have to say. Moving on. So, recently, Offset, uh, dropped, well, this past Friday, uh, Offset, who was one-third of the rap supergroup, the Migos, dropped his, uh, his debut solo album called Father of Four. And in the, uh, and in the line, and in one of the songs... He talks about how he didn't know he wasn't he didn't really know the mother of one of his children. Um, 
But his mother said that uh, thanks to Cardi B, Offset has grown as a man and is uh, taking responsibility of his child. Uh, Morgan, how do you feel? Um, like it goes down to one of my, I want to say one of my favorite, but a, a very good and very uh, beloved series, the Divergent series. Uh, at the end, it has this quote. It says that people change people. And for me, this is just an expression of that. Like, it's just people who are together, they just change you and they change who you are. So the mother, she said, she said uh, she's noticed tremendous growth and she credits Cardi B with instilling. I think she's helped him grow tremendously. And since she's been with her, I've seen a lot of growth. And so basically this, um, I know you're probably, I don't know if you've noticed this yet, Morgan, because uh, you still are kind of uh, young in your adult life. But as you get older and you see like your friends and your associates get into relationships, you see them change and hopefully for uh, for the better, for the better, sometimes for the worse. But you see them change and they elevate their lives and it's uh and a lot of it is thanks to uh to like the help and the companionship of their partner. Yeah, and hopefully you'll continue to grow and continue to change. Okay, that's it for the uh, front porch. Let's hop into the living room. So, the Momo Challenge viral spell. So, um, I actually, uh, before we even jump in, I'll just tell you how I just came across it. So, I was just on Twitter. Uh, it was a few days ago. I was on Twitter. And um, they're like, the Momo Challenge is like telling kids to kill their parents and uh, then kill themselves. And so it was on YouTube, and then uh, I was just searching around for articles about it, and I found an article, but it was like six months old. So this has always, uh, I feel like the Momo Challenge have all, has always uh, been around recently. Morgan, I know you're more entrenched into uh, the YouTube world, so tell me, tell me about this. So the Momo Challenge, this is honestly, it's a big example of why, as media uh we need to be more careful so what happened with the momo challenge is there was just a bunch of uh people a bunch of trolls and they started uh making what appeared to be kid-friendly content uh you know fortnite videos minecraft let's plays toy reviews stuff like that and in in it they would have a picture of this a Japanese statue. If anybody's seen it, if you've been on the internet for a while, you've seen it before. It's just, it's a creepy looking girl, and they called her Momo, which I took offense to, as someone who used to be called Momo. And uh, they would tell kids to uh, do bad things and like kill your parents and blah, 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 blah. It was a troll. It was basically just, it was a troll to mess with people and to mess with the YouTube algorithm. The problem happened was this troll started picking up uh, steam when YouTube started having to have to uh, double down on a lot of protections for videos with kids in it due to um, due to certain individuals. Basically, there's a lot of bad things going up. So basically, a lot of bad individuals are looking at videos of uh, kids doing things like gymnastics and putting in time codes and stuff like that in the video comment section and then on top of that uh some people were exposing youtube even though youtube had been trying to fight this for years they've been looking at this for years and youtube was getting pressure from advertisers and so they start cracking down on all these uh kid-friendly youtube channels and then this momo challenge starts coming up and the media just ran with it and they started discussing it and if you if you've seen this, it reminds you a lot of uh, the uh, what? Oh, let me tell you the name. Oh, oh, Tide Pod. Marcus, do you remember the Tide Pod challenge? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So for those of you guys who don't know, it was it was people eating Tide Pods. But what people don't often remember is that honestly, before like mass media and before uh, local news started picking up on this Tide Pod challenge and the viralness and started talking about it, it wasn't that popular of a challenge. And so it becomes this weird feedback loop where people start doing something bad 
and then media wants to talk about it and hurt the kids, and they talk about it, and the kids find out about it, and it just becomes this awful feedback group. So that's what's basically happening with the Momo Challenge right now, is that um, this thing started coming out, people were talking about it, and then mass media took it off and made it way bigger than it needs to be, and it endangered kids while doing that. So it's it's a very dangerous time. Hopefully, YouTube can find a way around it. Yeah, it's really just uh, outrage culture. And uh, with the Momo Challenge, it just goes to show that uh, YouTube's algorithm needs to be changed so that dangerous content such as uh, uh, subliminal suggesting that your uh, child dies, that your child kills a parent, that a child kills a parent, doesn't get promoted in their, like, Baby Shark uh, videos. But enough of the Momo Challenge. Uh, so last week we talked about this. Uh, Google Google will not reportedly uh, remove the Saudi government app that allows men to track women. Uh, I would hit you guys with the blank stare, but... At the end of the day, uh, when it comes to these tech companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon, uh, Lyft, Uber, uh, currency and pro- profit is the bottom line. So they are not going to risk their bottom line in order for people's safety. Uh, we have seen that time and time and again when it comes to just giving our, selling our data to advertisers and third parties or just giving our data or our personal lives to the government. So, like, we're just seeing this case over and over again. Yeah. At the end of the day, what we also have to remember is that these tech companies like Google, like Facebook, like Apple, they play towards the game. They play towards the place they're in. Like, they might act some way, they might act some way in America, but in China and in uh, every other place, they're playing a whole different game and acting like a whole different company. Yeah, and basically, um, it's basically, uh, so Amnesty International, uh, they called on both uh, Apple and uh, and Google to access the risk of human rights abuses on women. And the organization said that uh, apps are used for tracking and limiting women's movements, highlight the disturbing system of discrimination against women under the guardianship system and the need for genuine human rights rights reforms in the country rather than just social and economic reforms and so uh, my question my my question is this uh so what happens when a man uses this app to kill a woman because that's that's where it's leaning towards and will the will will a tech company as big as google uh take the blame or take the fall for this which i highly doubt that they will All right, but so moving on, uh, this might be a personal favorite of yours, Morgan. So Tesla is removing brick and mortar stores and they are releasing the Model 3, uh, Model 3 online only. And so this ba- this makes sense because with, with Tesla vehicles, they all are on pre-order. So you really don't get to drive off the lot with them. So you just basically you give the money, you put the down payment on there, and then you're basically in line for the Tesla. And you really don't even need to go to interact with the store with the brick and mortar. And um, my thing is, is this, are we seeing the death of traditional car uh, car salesmen or, and car lots? Yes. Already? Let's kill traditional cars. They've been hurt. In America's anybody, if you look into the car uh, car industry and how you buy your car, you'll know that uh, it, it's awful for you, uh, and that's awful for you as a consumer. It's awful for everybody in line except for the dealers. The only thing I will say is I did because over winter break I did spend uh, quite a lot of time in Tesla. Uh, I would love that's one of my dream cars. I'd love a Tesla. Uh, but it was fun. It was fun to go to like the Tesla and the mall and talk to the lady and look at the car and sit in there. Uh, I hopefully they will still have like test drives that people can do and stuff like that, uh, and that they won't get rid of all of that. 
But the Model 3 going online only will be, it'll be interesting to see how they sell. Tesla's definitely, they're, they're picking up some steam. Yeah. And that's good and, to see. And the Model 3 will be, uh, will be starting at $35,000. That's just the base vehicle. That's uh, not too bad, though. Yeah, especially for a Tesla. And more uh, Tesla news. So, Model Y, the SUV, will be unveiled March 14th. <laughs> So basically, uh, just the screenshots of it, this, uh, the new vehicle looks amazing. Would you see the new Tesla SUV? It'll probably look dope as well. Morgan? Uh, here's the thing. I, I'm not sure I want an SUV. Like, that's that's a bit much. I'm just saying it's a lot. Like, uh, from what I've heard and from what uh, Elon Musk said on Twitter, it's 10 cent, it's 10% bigger uh, it costs a lot, a bit more, and it, it has a less be- of a battery life. But if you have like a family, it'll work out. But as somebody who's not exactly planning on having a family anytime soon, it seems like a bit of a bit of a big leap for me. But there's a lot of people are excited for this uh, Model Y. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, last thing in the uh, living room. Uh, the trauma of being a moderator for Facebook. So the Verge basically, uh, they did a they did a interview, um, basically an investigative journalism uh, piece into uh, working into like moderators at Facebook who moderate the content, and basically they talk about how uh, you some many people uh, they develop PTSD from working at Facebook just because all the content they consume, which is harmful to themselves to their mental or some people who uh who are fine and don't have mental uh health issues at all from facebook and also how just some people when you work at like i in in new mexico when you work at facebook you make twenty eight thousand dollars which is not enough considering the job that they do which is uh shifting through content all day and posting like promoted posts and ads and some of those ads probably are harmful to like to a person like themselves or the type of people that they are. Yeah, this is something that we talk about a lot. And this is something that we, as a country, we need to deal with. Because, like, these people, they basically, like, imagine spending, like, nine hours. Imagine just spending five hours of just watching Alex Jones. Just five hours, Alex Jones, pure, uncut, Nothing else going on. It it just it affects your mental state, and it's hard for them to deal with it because they're literally seeking and looking out for things that are awful. And we just need to we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. And just uh, and it's like one thing just because uh, social media or just the internet in general isn't just. Uh, it's not just uh, a a thing. It's actually our. It's actually the new. It's the new outside, basically. And so it's hard in this day and age to separate the internet from outside world when it's one and the same. But that is all for uh, the living room. Uh, we're in the kitchen. Uh, we're following up on the Jordan Woods, uh, Tristan Thompson. Uh, cheating scandal. Morgan, did you have a chance to watch the, uh, uh, the, a seat at the red table, her interview with Jada Pinkett Smith? I did not. I did not watch the video. I saw some, I saw the highlights and read some okay. articles. So, <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, gotta sit there and watch I the have not, I, I had not watched a red table talk ever. And they've had some amazing guests. Even one of my favorite rappers, uh, Wale was on there last week, but what's Wale doing right now? By the way, uh, Wale, uh, he's making, he's recording his next album. Uh, he had a slew of EPs that dropped last year. Uh, he's doing some wrestling stuff. Uh, but yeah, that's what Wale is doing. But so I've never watched a bread ta- a bread table talk before ever in my life. But I was sure to watch this one. I was not going to miss out on this one. Uh, <laughs> So Jordan Woods is a real one. So basically, she's a real one from both sides. So basically, 
She said, uh, uh, she ain't throw, she did not throw Tristan Thompson under the bus. Um, she didn't throw herself under the bus. Uh, she basically said, yo, uh, me and Tristan were just chilling. Uh, I can see how it was uh, a bad look for me to be, uh, just sitting next to him the way I was sitting next to him. Uh, and I can see how people would take that as a bad look. But when I left for the morning, which was like 7 a.m., he kissed me and there was no passion. And then I just dipped. And then I didn't tell Chloe and them because she did not want to hurt them in their relationship. But, uh, yeah, but yeah. So, yeah, that was a lot. And then we found, we also found out Jordan Woods was on the Red Table Talk just because her father was a sound technician for the entire run of the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And that's how uh, the Smiths and Woods know each other. And actually, um, Will and Jada are the godparents of Jordan Woods. And so, uh, we're going to begin with Free Tristan, man. Uh, We just got a Free Tristan Thompson. He has been trying to get out of this relationship for three long years. We've seen it. We saw the video with him and the two girls at the hookah lounge. We saw him kiss. Th- no, we saw him kiss those two girls at the hookah lounge. Uh, we saw him and a young lady go back to a hotel together. And that was just two years ago. There was a cheating scandal before that when he was with Chloe as well. He cheated on her when he was in, in when she was in labor. And now we have this Jordan Woods scandal. Uh, so we just we just have to free Tristan Thompson, man. Like, what else does he have to do to get out of this relationship? That That's the bottom line. It's clear that he wants to go, and Chloe is not here for it. She wants to keep him. Uh, Yeah, and more, we'll talk about everything else. But Morgan, how do you feel about this hashtag free Tristan campaign? I mean, yeah, you got to let him out. You got to let him out. Uh, only thing... Only thing that kind of got me mad about this situation was when Jordan Wood said that she would get a lie detector test. I, I'm very upset about that for a very, very important reason. That reason being, I want to remind everybody in the black community and in every community that lie detector tests don't actually do anything and it's not real. Stop doing it. That's all I want to say. It's not real. Stop doing it. Yes, uh, whatever for that, but I, she's a real one, she's a real one for even saying a lie detector, she's like, yo, I'll even take the lie detector, showing that she believes her truth, Tristan believes her truth, but moving on, so, the Smiths are a godsend, so they saw, uh, I, I assume they saw the hate and the, uh, abuse, the verbal abuse that Jordan Woods was receiving from the Kardashian clan from Kardashian fans from fans of uh, the Keeping Up with the Kardashian show, and also we have to credit Jordan Woods for not turning off her comments. Usually, when stuff like this happens to celebrities or to high-profile socialites, they turn off their comments just for peace of mind. Jordan did not do that; she kept it all the way a hundred. So, but shout out for Jada Pickett Smith for. Being the lovely uh, mother type figure in this situation, Morgan, I don't know if you you didn't see it, but <laughs> so Jada Pickett had the black mother. Uh, I'm supporting you now, but just know when we get in private, I'm beating your butt up, and you know what you did was wrong. So that was the energy she was having, and she was just trying to guide her and say, "Hey, what you did was wrong, and you need to know that." But how can you be different in the future? That's how we all need to just be out here. How can we be different in the future? All right. And a few more things with the situation. Larsa Pippen, uh, who cheated on her husband with Future multiple times, uh, attacked uh, Jordan Woods for breaking up a marriage. And, of course, people attacked her, and then she apologized. Kim Kardashian is mad at Tristan Thompson. And not Jordan Woods. Jordan, she doesn't hold Jordan Woods at fault now. But she did hold Jordan Woods at fault 
when the scandal first uh, happened. And Kanye says he won't speak to Tristan. We don't care about Kanye. We don't care about Tristan either. Uh, this has been a fun week and a half with this uh, situation. And hopefully all parties will get it resolved. But next, so a little bit of politics in the uh, kitchen. We're going to dive into it more in the dining room. Uh, but Rep Ilhan Omar is, I believe she's in danger. Um, so credit to the freshman class of congresswomen. They have just been, uh, they have been rock stars. They have been uh, so, uh, they have been what the Constitution has called for our, our representatives to be in the house uh so she basically uh she did not she went back on her uh, alliance with israel because i don't know if you remember this morgan i think we talked about it here but how she uh how she questioned the alliance between israel and america and how people and how other politicians wanted that alliance just for um just for basically she said it just for financial purposes which is completely true she reiterated she reiterated uh, these statements as well. Uh, let me pull up the article real quick. So Rep Elhan Omar responds to committees response to committee chair chair charge of vile anti Semitic slurs. Oh no. Uh God uh internet. Uh okay. So, Hold on. Uh, yeah, keep going. I got you. Okay. So, uh, Ilhan Omar, she responded with, uh, she responded to Nita Lori, who is also a congressman. She said, uh, Omar said, our democracy is built on debate, congresswoman. I should not be expected to have allegiance slash pledge support to a foreign country in order to serve my country in Congress or serve on committee. The people of the fifth elected me to serve their interests. I'm sure we agree on that. She also said, I have not mischaracterized our relationship with Israel. I have questioned it, and that has been clear from my end. I am told every day that I am anti-American if I am not pro-Israel. I find that to be problematic, and I am not alone. I just so happen to be willing to speak up on it and open myself to attacks. My Americanness is questioned by the president and the GOP on a daily basis, yet my colleagues remain silent. I know what it means to be American, and no one will ever tell me otherwise. Being opposed to Niatu and the occupation is not the same as being anti-Semitic. I am grateful to many Jewish allies who have spoken out and said the same. So basically, uh, I uh, I don't know how you feel about this, Morgan, but I do agree with that, that if you are a politician, you are elected to serve the United States of America. Uh, you are not, you don't have to have an alliance to a country. We did not, the people of America or, or your district or your constituents did not elect you to be uh, friends with other countries. We elected you to serve our best interests. Yeah, that's definitely true. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to like a lot of a lot of people in America don't honestly have the best grasp on the massive, massive problem of Israel and Pakistan. I've taken I've taken some time just as a history buff to learn about what's going on in there and why. And it's just it's it's a conversation that's very, uh, very messy. And as Americans, I feel like. And at the low key, not to be racist type of thing, but just I feel like as Americans, we've just gone, well, we'll just go with the white people. We'll just go with the we'll just go with the side of Jews because we're already going with this side, and we're not gonna look at the other side. And I feel like we need somebody like her and the government to be like, no, we need to question this. We need to ask why are we doing this before we get in our bag with these people. For sure. Uh, but moving on, uh, more Ilhan news. I don't know if you've uh, seen this, but in West Virginia, uh, there was uh, there was like a meme that was going around that the West Virginia GOP had, uh, and it said uh, like "Never forget September 11th," and then a picture under it with Ilhan, Rip Ilhan Omar with uh, 
it looks like we've already forgotten about it. And it just goes to show that basically people are still racist. Uh, and the GOP is fanning this flame and they are not uh, denying it and they're not calling it out at all. Yeah, and it's just, it's sad. It's really sad. Uh, at the end of the day, there's a reminder. I saw this on Reddit today, of all places. And it said, um, it was a picture of this exact representative. And it said, uh, let us kick all the Jews out of Israel or something like those lines. Let us, uh, No, it said, uh, let us ban all the Jews from this country. Psych. That's what President Trump said. And to me, that's what it comes down to. Is it's the ideal that people are willing to back their side no matter what. No matter what. Like, we expect this. We've seen the Joe Reagan, the Joe Reagan, Alex Jones interview. That crazy, crazy, I've seen clips of it. It's just crazy mess that happened. And we there if that's the other side, if that's what the other side is listening to, if that is where they're getting their facts, at the end of the day, we can't trust them. That's just how we need to be out here. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but in happier news, the number one show in late night continues to prove that the brand is that the brand is strong. Desa Samero, let me Desa Samero, uh draw solid ratings in Showtime debut. This is a Mero had 151 100,000 viewers for its on air premiere February 21st. That's about 40% higher than the same day average of the duo's daily Vice series in 2007 2018. A replays later that night and same night streaming occur accounted for another uh, 212 212,000 and and bringing the first day total to 363,000. And so basically, uh, Showtime still has some catching up to do because shows like The Daily Show average 750,000. And while uh, last week, late last week tonight, averages about 900,000 each for their most recent runs. So, uh, Morgan, have you gotten a chance to watch the new DC Samaro show? Yes, I have. I've watched. Uh, I've watched the opening of each one of them. Uh, as I said to many people before, I'm not a fan of interviews. I skip the interviews on almost every single late night show. But I have liked what they produced before that. It's a really great show. Um, again, like it goes down to they put their bag with Showtime, and Showtime's it is kind of a more complex type of uh, type of. Uh, type of uh, just viewership and trying to get it. But for Showtime, this is a major pick. Uh, so, yeah, I actually... Um, so that first episode was really shaky to me, but the second episode, they seemed to really find their groove. Um, but, yeah, you actually... You would like the Don Cheadle interview just because Don Cheadle is, uh, is a Colorado... I don't know if he's a Colorado native, but he went to... Uh, he graduated from East High School. So I encourage you to check that out. But um yeah, it was uh it's really refreshing to see them with like they seem like more they seem more at ease. Like they seem like they're able to have more freedom at showtime. Definitely. Alright. And so we're in the dining room. Uh so, Morgan, can you tell me why Van Jones continues to be an idiot? I mean, I assume it's because he's an idiot. So <clears throat> let's run this let's let's run this story down for the people. For the people, Van Jones slammed as a sellout for praising conservative values. So, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Van Jones, he was on a talk show, some random talk show. Um, and he was talking about conservatives, and he said that conservatives have been spending the last couple years being the tent poles, the guardians, the last bastions 
of actual reform, of actual criminal reform, and he said that due to their belief in small government and uh, cutting costs and prison reform and all that, that they were doing a better job than Democrats. Marcus, let me hear you sing. Okay, so basically, uh, I'm trying to find the actual quote. Uh, I think that's what we're going to... uh, I think that is the soundbite I'm going to put on the opening of this. Uh, I'm trying to find what he... What he originally said. Um, Dang it. Uh, I can't find it. Hold up. Let me uh, talk about it some more. Let me find the uh, comment about it. So here's the thing about when you celebrate a Republican for criminal reform. The fact of the matter is, even if they are doing criminal reform... They're not doing it for the right reasons. They're not doing it because African Americans are historically disenfranchised. They're not doing it because we're stuck in a prison cycle that hurts everybody who's ever done anything. They're not doing it because they care about the black community. They're doing it because, eh, we don't want to pay the prisons. They're doing it because, eh, we're trying to cut costs. They're doing it because they don't care and it's just something for them to do. And we can't celebrate that. I mean, I know everybody's out here talking about we need to put branches out. We need to like make sure that we connect, that we're not as divided as we believe we are. But as I continue to say, America has always been divided and we will always be divided. People will be out here being like, oh, in the past we weren't divided. Oh, in the past we all agreed. No, that's not what happened. That's not how it used to be. If you look into the past, it's not everybody who was agreeing. It's all the white people who are agreeing. Okay. So Van Jones, he said at CPAC, CPAC is basically a conservative um, a conservative conference. He said, the conservative movement in this country, unfortunately, from my point of view, is not a leader on the issue of reform. He pointed to Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant, Georgia Governor Nathan Deal, and Secretary of Engine, Energy and former Texas Governor Rick Perry as Republicans who were able to cut the prison population and crime at the same time. What you're seeing now is Republican governors being tough on the dollars, tough on crime, and shrinking the prison population. This is supposed to be my issue. You are stealing my issue, he told the cheering conservative crowd. I'm going to stay in my party, but take some daggone credit for being smart. Take some daggone credit for getting it right. So... Uh, Van Jones, at the end of the day, he is a personality, and he's going to do what he has to do to get his measures of, to get his message across. He also, in 2016, he said, "How can you explain the uh, Trump presidency?" And when it comes to uh, when it comes to Van Jones, just reading that comment, he says that um, prison reform is supposed to be his issue, and. Um, I me reading the comment doesn't give it the correct content. The correct context. You have to actually hear, uh, hear his, uh, hear his voice because he says it in a laughing matter. Something as serious as prison reform and cutting the crime rates is very serious and not a laughing matter. And what Van Jones has continued to done, he has erased the hard work. He has erased the activism. He has erased. Um, he has erased like. The work that, uh, the work that companies, not companies, um, the work that uh, nonprofits have done, such as uh, Black Lives Matter, such as the Poor People's Campaign, that ha- that they have pushed for, they have, it, it has not been Van Jones on that front line trying to get prison reform. He is a figurehead. He hasn't done the work. It has been those people in the street. It has been the people uh, protesting who have been sending letters to their congressmen. It hasn't been Van Jones talking to conservatives, making them feel safe about their choice of them voting for a bigot, a racist, a uh, homophobic, um, uh, in, in, an inadequate president. No, it has been the people on the front line. And what Van Jones has done has been what has been happening to African Americans since the beginning of the United States. All of our, all 
every African every African American, all their hard work has always been a race with just one person saying, "Hey, you guys get credit for this." So let me give you the whole thing. Van Jones is basically essentially saying, "Hey, because you guys have done this, this, and this, let me just give you guys credit for the whole thing and not give credit to the African Americans who have put pressure on you, who have made you, who have forced you to do these types of maneuvers, who have made you try to make these types of uh, legislative legislative acts." Yeah, it, it, it's it's sad. It's really sad. But moving on. On to our final story of the night, before, of course, the grand opening, grand closing, Stephen Clark, run him down. Okay, so uh, the police who shot Stephen Clark, uh, they are getting no jail time. They were, uh, the jury and the judge have found, have found him rightfully, uh, just rightfully, uh, right, they were rightfully lawful in their, uh, in their shooting, I don't. If you guys remember the story, there have been so many. But Stephen Clark was in in Oakland, California. He was in his grandmother's uh, backyard on the phone. Police thought he was somebody else, and instead of saying "Hey, police," they just shot him. And um, this just continues to prove that um, that the system is not built for black people. It's, it never has been, and it never will. And just because that just like me as me as a as a young black man, that is my that is my greatest fear. I do not like interacting with the police at all. Uh, just I don't like talking to them. I don't like inter- I don't like I don't like being near them. I don't like being around them, period. So seeing some seeing once again uh, police getting because when police shoot you, they basically get away with it. So. As a black person, I already know me talking to me talking to the police already already puts my life at risk, regardless of what the situation is. It could be me asking for directions, but just know me asking for directions could be uh, my last, but that could be my last breath. So it just continues. So with the Stephen Clark shooting conspiracy, not the conspiracy, the Stephen Clark shooting, it just continues to prove that black people do not matter. And to the, to law enforcement, to the law system, to the justice system in general. Yeah, definitely. It's just as someone who, uh, me myself, I was part of uh, a lot of Black Lives Mo- uh, Matters movements, especially at uh, East High School. It was part of uh, the very first high school walkouts for this. It's just nothing has changed. And that's that's all we can say is like nothing has changed. Yeah. But for uh for sure, for sure. But uh grand opening, grand closing, you got this. That's right, grand opening, grand closing from one depressing topic to hopefully something that will put a smile on your face. Um so my school has their uh spring break this week and something that I've been told multiple times by multiple people is the weirdest ideal they've ever heard of. It's the first week of March. I never understood why a did this. It's always at an awkward time for me, but uh, it's the first week of March. I'm on spring break. I'm here at my, my room, not doing anything. Everybody's gone. So I'm basically going to spend the next week and a half doing a combination of homework and uh, media. And so I thought, why not share what I'm going to do this week with everybody else? So um, I'm going to run you down a list of a couple of things, a couple of shows that uh, I'm looking at. Uh, Tomorrow I'm going to the movie theater. I'm seeing uh, How to Train Your Dragon 3, one of the, the most consistent the most consistent franchises to ever grace the silver screen. If you have never seen How to Train Your Dragon movie, uh, you should definitely see it. It's one of the most amazing series I've ever seen. I'm definitely going to binge watch all of season two of Dragon Prince again, made by the creators of Avatar The Last Airbender. I've already seen season two. It's amazing. So any of you guys out here, 
like you like Avatar the Last Airbender, you should watch it. Uh, of course, I'm going down my black log of anime, My Hero Academia. Everybody should be on that. Um, but one show that I I caught Saturday and I binged the whole day and I was so excited. It just brought me back to OG Momo when I was in high school. I used to just binge all night was a domestic uh, girlfriend. I don't know if uh, you heard of this, Marcus. But uh, it's a show about... Um, I'm not going to tell y'all what it's about. It's just going to sound weird. But uh, Domestic Girlfriend, it's a major, big drama this season. And it's amazing. Any of you guys out here, if you like anime, if you like drama, if you like the Mori show, just just check it out. It's amazing. It's one of the greatest shows. And uh, to round it out for video games, I'll probably finish up a couple of games. Uh, Bayonetta, Let's Go Pichu and Eevee, play a little bit of that. Of course, Smash Bros. And I have a few things to finish up in uh, Kingdom Hearts and uh, my second playthrough of Persona 5. I got to finish that. So I definitely have a lot of stuff lined up this week. And uh, hopefully I can keep myself above water, keep myself entertained. But I'm so excited for this week. And uh, I hope you guys are as well. So Marcus, send them out. All right, cool. So... um... Uh, we're changing the schedule up this week. So this is dropping. Uh, we're going back to our original schedule. So uh, Super Flow Bros and Desktop to Cartridge will be dropping on uh, on Tuesday. We have two. Uh, we have two Fantastic Flows dropping on Wednesday. Uh, we have uh, we have a few uh, more podcasts down the pipeline that I won't announce yet, but I'm super excited for. Uh, once again. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at 26 and G. Follow us on Instagram at 26 and Glenco. For, uh, like our Facebook page at 26 and Glenco Media Network. Uh, follow, like our YouTube page on 26 and Glenco Media Network. If you leave, if you leave a five star comment, we will read it on the air regardless of what it says. So make sure that you do that. Uh, we really need uh, subscribers who want to hear from you guys. Let, let us know what we're doing well, what we can improve on. Um, yeah, that's just, uh, that's about it. And, uh, until next time.